Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? Good, Brian. It's good to see you on this uh, uh, Thursday morning towards the end of August already. Hey, two days before Traverse Day, more importantly, Matt Shipman. Traverse Day is always huge. Great card at Saratoga. We're going to jump right into the big one. Of course, the Midsummer Derby, Matt, $1.25 million. As I look at this Traverse field, my friend, it's an interesting race. But I noticed that there are no horses trained by Todd Pletcher in the Traverse, which is strange enough year to year. But I have to say I'm a little I don't want to start out this show negative, but I have to say I'm a little disappointed because I think Todd Pletcher has three of the most interesting three year olds in the nation. And for various reasons, none of them are here for the Travers. Yeah, it's a little disappointing uh, for us racing fans. And I'm sure it's very, very disappointing for Todd, who I think now, Brian, it's three out of the last four years. He hasn't had a horse um, uh, in the in the Travers for various circumstances this year, Modonagal and now Charge It um, are not ready to go uh, for Charge It. Uh, uh, you know, a, a foot abscess that has uh, that is on its way to healing, but just not quite there. Um, yeah, would it have been a better race if Charge It was in there? Uh, sure, it would have certainly been a, a more interesting race to handicap. Not that it's not an interesting race as it stands. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I just miss Mo Donegal, who uh, after a big yeah. Belmont win has been on the shelf with an injury. And 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 Nest, I think uh, Mo Donegal could be the best three-year-old cult in the country. Nest is the best three-year-old filly in the country. I can't. Listen, hey, she was uh, odds on. She was three to 10 or so in a grade one, historic, prestigious Alabama, and she won easily as we saw last week. So it's hard to say they made the wrong decision by running in the Alabama, but I think she's one of the best three-year-olds in the country. And Charge It, gosh darn it, Matt, is, is probably the most interesting three-year-old male in the country. I think his potential is still gigantic, and it would have been nice to see him. But, hey, you're right. The foot abscess uh, uh, didn't allow it. It looks like he's going to the Penn Derby next. We still have a good field for the Travers. You got me, by the way, Matt. You got me with the... Pletcher hasn't been in three of the last four years now. That That's surprising. Good st uh, stat there, my friend. And looking at the Travers, I guess we start with, now that the Pletchers are out, we start with number six, Epicenter, who we may have started with even if the Pletchers were in, Matt. Epicenter has been first or second in seven consecutive stakes races. He's won four narrow losses and three others dating back to December. Surely he's been the best three-year-old colt if you're looking at January through August. Clearly he's been the most consistent three-year-old colt uh, uh, since the Derby Trail began back in January for uh, 2022. All those, uh, all those seconds, a bunch of wins, second in the Kentucky Derby, second in the Preakness, the wins on the uh, Derby Trail, at fairgrounds in Louisiana, um, deserves to be the favorite, seven of five. Hard to put a knock on Epicenter, except that he has not won a grade one race. I'm going to piece Shaw that lack of grade one wins uh, for Epicenter. It's true, he hasn't won a grade one race yet, but He's won grade one races. I mean, the Risen Star was one of the best races of the early part of the year. The Louisiana Derby. And even the Jim Dandy. Look who he beat in the Jim Dandy. He beat the Preakness winner. He beat Zandon. He beat a very good Tawny Port in the Jim Dandy. So I, the fact that he hasn't won a grade one race matters nothing to me. I, I think he was a little bit unlucky in both the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. And I think the Jim Dandy was his best race yet. I like to see a win over the Saratoga track heading into the Travers, and that's what at the center has, Matt. He's also versatile. Uh, this looks like a race without a ton of speed, so maybe at the center is uh, much closer to the early lead than he was in the Jim Dandy. Yeah, I think we kind of had that conversation a little bit before the Jim Dandy also. You know, there was a lot of talk about, okay, Epicenter is going to go back to that running style that we saw earlier this year where he was on the front end 
and he was pressing the pace, but but uh, he did not do that. Uh, Joel Rosario obviously felt the, felt no need for him to be on the lead. He knew what kind of horse he had underneath him, rode him with uh, a 100% confidence, and he performed that way. So here we are again. Yeah, yeah, I guess if Epicenter, if Rosario wants to go to the lead, he could go to the lead. He could get to the lead um, in the Travers again. I'm I'm 100% confident leaving it up to Rosario. Yeah, and I'm glad you said a confident ride in the gym, Danny, because that's exactly what it looked like to me. It looked like Rosario felt like he was on the best horse in the gym, Dandy, again, against some good horses. And uh, he, he knew what he had underneath him, and he let him relax early and roll late. And it was pretty impressive to me, at least. Second choice on the morning line is on the rail, Matt. I, I wasn't sure who the second choice would be. I guess Cyber Knight. If you're looking at those grade one wins, I guess Cyberknife is the one that you would uh, uh, point to as the uh, top threat to Epicenter in here, in here because he's got two grade one wins. Yeah, He did it yeah. in the Arkansas Derby earlier this year. He won the Haskell in his last start, grade one win at Monmouth Park. But then he got the Kentucky Derby where he really was not a factor. Yeah, the Kentucky Derby was certainly a clunker and uh, uh, at this point, I guess it's fair enough to, to draw a line through it. He, he bounced back out of the Derby and and won the Haskell. Um, certainly, and we talk about it plenty of times, certainly he is a horse that is on the improve. He's been on the improve throughout the three-year-old year, maturing physically, and, and most importantly with Cyberknife, improving mentally, uh, going up the rail in tight quarters, in the Haskell to to get that win, um, he'll have to go the mile and a quarter in here, as is the case with uh, uh, everybody in the field. Uh, um, you know, didn't work out well uh, in the Derby, but uh, uh, he's moved on through from that race. <clears throat> okay, uh, we can draw a line through the Kentucky Derby, but I still have it in the back of my mind that he hasn't beaten horses like Epicenter and Zandin and Mo Donegal yet at a classic distance. I said I like the fact that uh, Epicenter had the race over the track. Cyberknife it does not. Everything you said, though, is true. I mean, he's always been a great-looking workhorse, and he's putting it together, I guess, both uh, physically and maybe more importantly, like you said, mentally. Still, he he didn't win the ma win by much. He didn't win the Haskell by much. Uh, is the Haskell? It's, uh, and, and there's still some question. How good is the Haskell? How good is that narrow win over Taiba with Jack Christopher not far behind. Maybe it's every bit as good as the horses he'll face in Travers. We'll we'll see. Uh, Cyberknife, an interesting horse, mm -hmm. getting good for getting better and better for trainer Brad Cox, and and a horse uh, certainly to respect from the rail. Third choice on the morning line surprises me a little bit in that the Chad Brown favorite of the three is not the Grade One winners. It's not Zandon. It's not early voting the Preakness winner. It's in fact Artorias, who's only had three lifetime starts. Son of Arrogate looked awfully good, though, Matt, in that win in the curler. Yeah, Brian, who to thunk it that Chad Brown's got three horses in the Travers, Travers and the shortest price amongst the three, including early voting in Zandon, is Artorias at 9-2, to two, a horse who only has three starts at this point. Right. And it's been a very nice progression. He certainly stepped up. He got to Saratoga for the Curlin Stakes. He beat Gilded Age. He beat Creative Minister, two horses, I think, who are now we look at a little bit, certainly lower than a grade one level. But uh, it's a real question mark as he steps up big time here to face the likes of Epicenter and Cyberknife and Zandon and Early Voting and Rich Strike and so on. But he looks so good in doing it in the Curlin over the track that uh, you have to consider him. It's it's a tough spot for your fourth lifetime race. Uh, his sire uh, was able to do something similar and do it in spectacular fashion. Artorius, uh, he's got the connections. He's uh, going to be ridden by our Rad Ortiz, the leading jockey at Saratoga. He certainly is an interesting, I guess you'd call him a wild card in this field because the other horses uh, are, are, are more known. This will be his graded stakes debut, and he's picked a tough race to do it in the grade one Travers.
I've already mentioned Zandon, Matt, and and I guess I guess we could say the impressive winner of the Grade One Bluegrass has never run a bad race in his career. But on the other hand, he and and he has a nice prep over the track. I think after uh, his first race from the Derby, what he did in the Jim Dandy when that wasn't the race to win, when that was a race to get him tightened for the Travers, was a good performance. But then there's the school of thought. Well, he's 0 for three against that epicenter. How's he going to win the Travers? Yeah, and, and you know, like you said, never run a bad race, and in, and in some of those races he has some excuses, but in other races, you know, he just fell a little bit short, and, and so you have to start wondering: was it the bad trip, or does he have a tendency to uh, not to want to get to the winner circle? But uh, however you want to interpret it, you know, uh, Zandon being the third choice fourth choice in this race suddenly makes him more attractive odds wise. Yeah. Five to one on Zandon is pretty attractive odds for a horse. Again, who's run nothing but very good races his entire career, but he's over three against that center. All right. Uh, next on the early list, Matt, it, it, I guess he's another wild card. He's another Chad Brown. And I guess he's another wild card because early voting, what do you do with early voting? He's got the most speed in the field. In fact, I, think epicenter is the most likely horse to be close to him early look good in the preakness when he had a, a cheaper horse to run at to track and then pounce and then open up in the wood memorial he was caught late after setting the pace by mo donegal but in the jim dandy he set the pace and it didn't look to be such a taxing pace but they all went by him epicenter zandon and tawny port all went by him rather easily in the Jim Dandy. Can he bounce back here? I guess he can. Why not? Um, but certainly, Brian, uh, uh, everybody expected more from early voting in the Jim Dandy uh, um, on the heels of that uh, Preakness victory. But, you know, Chad is the kind of trainer, you know, that he, he picks out a target and they picked out the Preakness as a target. Uh, bypassing the Kentucky Derby, and it sure worked out very well. And and maybe and clearly the Jim Dandy was not a prime target, and maybe the Travers is more of what they were look what they are looking at. But yeah, that fourth place fourth place finish in the Jim Dandy, whatever the situation, uh, was disappointing. Can he bounce back? Yeah, why not? Eight to one on the morning line. Wow. Yeah, two races removed from that Preakness win. Uh, those are interesting odds as well. Um, and everything I said about Zandon using the Jim Dandy, like you said, was, was a prep for the Travers. You could say that for early voting. But the fact that he had a relatively easy lead in that race and was clearly fourth best in a four-horse race is concerning for me. As it is concerning for Rich Strike, those who support the Kentucky Derby winner, the 80-1 to one long shot who shocked the world with his kentucky derby rally uh it's got to be concerning what he came back and did in the belmont stakes uh rich strike of course skipped the preakness famously the derby winner did not run in the preakness because they thought the belmont was the right race for him he didn't do much at all in the belmont stakes mad and that's the last time we've seen him on the racetrack yeah uh you know and and the question obviously is, uh, can he get back to running a race close to what happened uh, in the Kentucky Derby where he was a tremendous long shot to win the race? But, you know, I want to point out that uh, in races leading up to the Kentucky Derby, he was consistently a long shot in those races also, uh, ran better, second, third, and et cetera. Uh, um, but... Uh, you know, the, the, the Belmont Stakes, certainly a disappointment. I, I find some of Eric Reed's uh, comments about uh, Rich Strike's training at Saratoga a little curious when he, uh, after his last work, when he, he worked fast, Brian, you know, five furlongs and 59 and, and change. And Reed said, you know, I don't know. He, he's, he's a fast horse and maybe someday in a race he'll decide that he, wants to use his speed and won't drop back to the, you know, to last and make, and make that one big run. Well, 
okay, like, what's the point of that comment? I, I, I you know, you know, scratch my head uh, about that and wonder if you think that speed, his speed would be a helpful tool, then let's, then, then why not use it and say, oh, maybe he'll decide that, I don't know. I find the whole thing a little bit baffling uh, and certainly uh, doesn't put me in the corner of, do I expect him to run a Kentucky, Kentucky Derby-esque race in the Travers? Yeah, well, the, the Kentucky Derby was a, a suicidal, crazy, once in a once in many decades kind of early pace, and uh, he's not going to get that in the Travers. So, who knows? Maybe he'll be a little closer to the lead, but uh, hard to jump on him here in this spot, Matt. Speaking of fast workouts, how, did you see the Iowa bred last weekend at Saratoga in his second? Workout at Saratoga, 45 and change for Ain't Life Grand. Uh, widespread panic fans will be uh, rooting for Ain't Life Grand, as well as the uh, Iowa uh, breeding program supporters. He's he's really well bred though for an Iowa bred uh, Matt. Uh, it's not a not this time out of a well bred Medagliadoro mare. He looks to be getting good, but he looks to be getting good at distances far shorter. A mile sixteenth is the farthest he's ever gotten. He's only left Prairie Meadows once before. This ain't Altoona anymore, folks. This is Saratoga. This is the Travers. Ain't Life Grand is swinging for the fences on Saturday. That's for sure, Brian. Um, certainly an Iowa bred with a Kentucky bred pedigree. Um, 20 to 1. Uh, there is a horse that's a longer shot in the race. I'm not sure why. I, I, I like Ain't Life Grand a little bit, but uh, yeah, this this spot seems awfully tough for him, and uh, who knows. The other long shot you spoke about, Matt, is Gilded Age, and yeah, Gilded Age looks like a horse. He, he rallies every time. He's kept pretty good company uh, throughout his career, and uh, he was the one running late in that curl-in, although Artorius was an easy winner of the... Uh, of the uh, curling stakes and Gilded Age kind of uh, loped up for second, maybe a mile and a quarter, trained by Bill Mott, another well-bred, good-looking horse, maybe a mile and a quarter. He's a horse who can fill out the exotics with a late run. Yeah, I find him a little bit interesting. Obviously, he went over to Maidan and and uh, did very little running in the UAE Derby, but that was true of a number of horses. But Mott seems to be a trainer who doesn't have any problem bringing horses back from uh, that, you know, those late winter races in Maidan and having them come back and run really well. Yeah, yeah, he's done it before and he's come back with two good races now uh, on allowance win at Churchill. He he is a horse without any early speed as well. And, and, and again, I don't know if that bodes well in this Travers. Matt, I, I want to ask you a couple quick questions. This is a big race. This is the biggest race of the summer. Uh, do you see the winner of this race as uh, the probable or the favorite? For the three-year-old championship, I guess maybe probable or or maybe the favorite. I guess also depending on who that winner is. If it you know if it's one of the bigger names, if it's epicenter and such. But you know ultimately it, it's hard to uh, uh, you know put a bow on the three-year-old male championship uh, at this point in the year because. These three-year-olds are eligible to run in the Breeders' Cup uh, against older horses. And, and a win in one of those races uh, uh, by a three-year-old change everything. It could. It could. A, a win in the Breeders' Cup Classic could change anything. I don't know if there's a horse who would lose the Travers or would not be in the Travers and can win the Breeders' Cup Classic. I would struggle to to figure that one out, but it, it could happen. Um I think Epicenter would uh, really take a good lead in this division if he won the Travers. And I think if Zandon or Artorias or Cyberknife, especially Cyberknife, early voting even, were to win this, then they would move at least temporarily to the head of the class. This is a, this is a big race and an interesting Travers. We'll see. Um, Flight line, life is good. Hot Rod Charlie, a bunch of good older horses, country grammar. Uh, the classic will be tough for a three-year-old, but uh, these these look like good horses. Matt, at this point, I want to remind everyone who's tuned into our special Travers show here, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
on Horse Racing Nation, Matt and I appreciate it as we appreciate you tuning in every week. Turn on those notifications so you never miss another episode of Horse Center. Matt, there's so many good races on this card. We got Jack Christopher heading a big three-year-old sprint. We got Jackie's Warrior heading a big uh, uh, older horse sprint. Uh, we, we've got uh, good turf fillies. We've got good turf uh, 12 furlong males and the Sword Dancer, a great card. We've decided on our secondary race of the week, if you will, and maybe they shouldn't take a second spot, but with the Travers, they have to, Matt. It's the personal ensign. It's grade one. This used to be a 10 furlong race, but I guess uh, in recent years, they've knocked it down to nine furlongs, so maybe thinking about the Breeders' Cup a little bit. And uh, it, we might have, at least around a route of ground, Matt Schiffman, we might have the four top older females in the country going in this compact field of five in the personal ensign. Yep, yep. And here we are again at Saratoga, uh, another small field, but certainly <clears throat> a very, very high quality field with uh, four, as you mentioned, uh, uh, of the older ma older females who uh, have done very good things at different times during this year. Yeah, let's let's start. Let's do it a little different this time, Matt. If you will, let's start from the rail out because the 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 horse on the rail is the defending older female dirt champion. She's also the defending champion of the personal ensign, and Latruska, uh, who began her career by being a dominant filly in Mexico City and became an American champion. As I just said, she could be at a crossroads here, Matt. Um, she's coming off a bad performance when we last saw her at Belmont. But on the other hand, she's won so many big races the last couple of years, like this one, that it's hard to ignore her speed and her class on the rail as the third choice, Latruska. Yeah, uh, imagine that, Brian. Uh, Latruska as the third choice. And, and it, you know, it's interesting. And, I, and that's the way racing is. That's the way sports is. But it was only two months ago, Brian, the, the, a little more than two months ago, pushing three months, um, that uh, several of these horses met in the Ogden Phipps on Belmont Stakes uh, weekend. And, and, and Latruska was at the top of the, was at the top of the list then, winning races in her front end style. Um, she went to the lead in the FIPS and and then just uh, gave it up uncharacteristically. Um, I remember before the race, the tra trainer Faustina Gutierrez was a little bit concerned that Lutruska was not showing her usual spit and fire before the race. And I guess it turned out that uh, 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 she didn't run her usual race. But yeah, crossroads here after a layoff, hopefully recovered and, and at 100 percent. She is back and no doubt will uh, try and use that front running style. Um, and I guess uh, having Latrus get third choice on the morning line is interesting. It's interesting. But yeah, uh, what have you done for me lately? And the FIPS was not good. Um, if her trainer's correct. Uh, and, and it was just uh, a not feeling good type of day or type of week for Latruska for the FIPS. She could bounce back, uh, certainly. I am concerned that in two of her last four races, she uncharacteristically kind of spit the bit uh, after facing some pressure, the, the, the yeah. other one being four races back in the Breeders' Cup distaff. So there are questions with Latruska. That's why, they sh why she's all of a sudden the third choice after being heavily favored in this race last year and heavily favored in the FIPS, her last race, as Matt pointed out. One thing I did see in the FIPS, though, Matt, was search results was uh, was able to uh, stay close and pounce and put Latruska away rather easily in the FIPS. If it's a different Latruska, that will be a much tougher task for search results. But search results, uh, a Chad Brown four -year, trained four-year-old mm -hmm. really seems to be getting better. I think she's good uh, going two turns uh, and, and she has a lot of speed. So Latruska will have her work cut out for her with the horse directly to her outside search results. Yeah, and and uh, uh, search results, you know, went from uh, the FIPS and and went to Monmouth Park and won the Molly Pitcher, uh, which is a grade three, certainly on a racing surface uh, that would be very kind to that Chad Brown uh, filly. 
<clears throat> yeah, that was a fast track at Monmouth. That's day for sure. Search results has looked good. Uh, the race before the FIPS was very impressive as well at Belmont Park. So search results going good, and she has the speed to stay with Latruska early. That 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 will be a story as it unfolds. Another story will be the emergence of Clarier as the division leader, the four-year-old, the beautifully bred daughter of Curlin has taken over the division, as they say, Matt, because she was able to out-duel, out-battle after they came from well back together. She out-battled Malathot to the wire in that grade one FIPS, where the top four mares from this race are all were all in. And Clarier proved best late in that race over Malathot. And uh, she validated that performance last time, Matt. She validated that performance in the Shoe V when she beat Malathot, uh, 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 Crazy Beautiful was also in that race. She finished third in the Shoe V. So the top three from the Shoe V are back. And that was actually a more clear cut or decisive victory for Clarier last time. Yeah, that's for sure. And, you know, we talked about it towards the end of, uh, of last year that Clarier had the look of a horse that was getting better and better. And, and so she has. And Steve, another Steve Asmussen, runner who has absolutely flourished uh, up at Saratoga, uh, winning big races. Um, he's won so many big races this summer. Uh, um, Clarier, deservedly the favorite in the personal ensign. Yeah, she is deservedly the favorite after that Shoe V win. Crazy Beautiful was, uh, I guess, under 10 to 1 in that short field in the Shoe V. She was third best. It was it was really about Clarier and Malathot. I don't know now that we had Latruska and search results. Crazy Beautiful's a nice filly for, uh, for trainer Kenny McPeak, but I don't know if her chances get any better now because, as I said, I think these are the best four uh, uh, dirt females in the country going uh, two turns, at least older dirt females going two turns. So Crazy Beautiful is in tough, but Malathot is back, Matt. She was, of course... Uh, the favorite still over Clarier, even after getting beat by Clarier in the FIPS. Uh, she was uh, the favorite in the Shoe V, and Clarier beat her. Pletcher thought she wasn't at her best that day for whatever reason. She's back. I will say she beat Clarier for four for four last year when they were both three year olds. Another beautifully bred daughter of Curlin, Matt. Can she turn the tables on Clarier in this, I guess now in their seventh meeting? It's a rivalry. Uh, yeah, it is a rivalry. Yeah. Nice to see. Both of these horses have run a lot, have run often. Um, they don't run bad races. So uh, uh, it's hard not to expect a finish in this race where uh, uh, it's going to be Clarier and Mal Malathot. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Latruska could bounce back, as you said, and, and search results is better than ever, as I said. But yeah, I, I think there's a good chance that this race could come down to the same two mares that it came down to in the FIPS and the uh, and the Shoe V. Malathot, having beaten Clarier four times, I know she can do it. Has Clarier gotten better? That's what betters are saying. That's what the morning line is saying. And that's what current uh, current form is saying. But I, I do have a little bit of belief in Malathot. You said she's never run a bad race, and that is completely true. But on the other hand, I don't think she ran her race in the shoe v so it'll be interesting what malathot can do if she can bounce back here in the personal ensign and get the better of clarier once again after all those wins she had against her last year all right sir uh, a big day like i said jackie's warrior jack christopher uh, uh, a really interesting sword dancer uh, but it's time to pick the two races we talked about the travers and the personal ensign you go first you go with the travers first matt Okay. Well, you know, Brian, uh, we talked about it. Epicenter has been so consistent uh, all year long uh, in in the big races uh, and deserves to be the favorite. And, and nothing would surprise me about Epicenter running another big race at Saratoga, another big win for, the, for Team Asmussen and winning the race. But I don't love the odds, Brian. Uh, um, I'm going to take a shot with the lightly raced up and comer, hoping that in start four, um, Artorias do, and I am not comparing Artorias to, uh, 
uh, his sire, Arrogate, but but maybe being able to do what Arrogate did and, and win the Travers in his first try in a grade one, I, I, I'd probably like to have higher odds than nine to two, but I'm going to take a choice that Chad Brown's first Travers win will come from Artorias. I respect Artorias in here, Matt, and, and I, I respect your pick of him. He's the up-and-comer, and, and if you believe that this three-year-old male division has been beating each other and that epicenter is very beatable once again as he was beaten in the Kentucky Derby and the uh, and the Preakness, Artorias is, is a very interesting pick there. And, and unfortunately, I'm not convinced that the favorite is going to lose this race. I, I thought that Jim Dandy was a pretty powerful performance by Epicenter. And I just know of his class. I, I do kind of go along with the, the the train of thought that the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness was uh, unlucky for Epicenter. And I, I do think he's been the best three-year-old male since January. So I'm on Epicenter once again. I, I think he's uh, this is his race to win. He's versatile and he's obviously good over the track and he's probably better than ever for trainer Steve Asmussen. Um, Zandon, I actually think Zandon is, is the horse he has to beat and that's the horse he's beaten three times already. How about you in the personal ensign? I, I see that you're not on the favorite in the personal ensign either. I am not. And hey, let's... <laughs> Let's look at it. Steve Asmussen could have a tremendous day on the Saturday with the likes of Jackie's Warrior and Epicenter and Clarier. Clarier, another fantastically bred in fine form, deserving to be the favorite. But again, uh, 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 six to five, seven to five is not attractive to me and i'm gonna go back to what you said earlier brian when you said in terms of latruska it's all like what have you done for me lately and it wasn't that long ago that latruska was so good i like the odds as a possible third choice in here i'm gonna look i'm gonna pick latruska to get back to her old form well, if you could draw a line through the Ogden Phipps, and maybe there was a reason to, Latrusco makes a lot of sense in the personal answer. I worry about the pressure, though, from search results. I kind of feel like it's set up again for Clary or in Malifaux just a little bit like it was in the Phipps. So I'm on, I'm on the two ralliers in here. I picked the favorite in the Travers. I think Epicenter will have better odds in the Travers than Clarier will in the first lance. And I could see Clarier being four to five in this field. And, and at those odds, she's a no thanks. I'll pass on those odds for me because I, I don't think she's head and tails of that ahead of Malathot or Latruska or search results. I think Malathot can turn the tables. Pletcher, Pletcher clearly said that that was not the best Malathot in the Shuvi. And I tend to agree. I'm looking for another good race out of those two maybe a race much more like we saw in the Phipps. And I think Malathot could turn the tables here, and I think the odds are going to be right. So I'm going to try Malathot in a personal answer. Oh, what a show, Matt. All right. We love it. We can't wait for the big day at Saratoga. Let me get a parting shot from you, my good friend there in New Jersey. Big day for sure, Brian. 13 races, all of those uh all of those grade ones and and so many of the big uh, names. Uh, so good luck to all of our Horror Center fans. Again, Brian and I appreciate that you watch and join us every week. Um, so thanks for watching the show. Yeah, thanks for watching the show. And more importantly, I hope you all win out there. That's very important to us that the viewers are having fun and winning money betting on these races. I want to thank our sponsor, the best contest site out there. That's Derby Wars. We can't do the show without the race graphics from our friend Candace Curtis in Louisville. Thanks to Candace, and thanks to you all once again for watching. We'll be back next week. We got the Pacific Classic starring Flightline to talk about, as well as the Jockey Club Gold Cup. We'll see you right here next week on another edition of Horse Center.